Well, good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. This is Harry Brailsford from SMB Nation, and it is our weekly webinar. So it's the Thursday webinar, and hey, guess what? It's the uh, the week prior to the fall conference. So our 12th annual fall conference is coming up in just over a week at Microsoft Redmond. So still time to discover what's going on there. Go to fall2014.smbnation.com to get the details and uh, jump on a plane, jump on Southwest, Air Southwest Airlines or something and come out and participate. We've got a really interesting agenda this year focused uh, on uh, O3 server and migration conversation, some hybrid conversation, and Office 365 conversation. So um, take a look at that. Again, one week out to the uh, SMB Nation conference. Um, we also have a prize today. So stay Stay on board, folks, till the very end. Uh, the prize we have is a Jawbone Jambox Black Diamond, about $180 giveaway. So you're going to want to stay on, and we will draw from someone who's currently online um, to give away the, uh, the, the Jawbone Jambox. As for myself, it's been a pretty busy couple weeks. Last week, I believe I told you that I was uh, out in Boston and Toronto, uh, the DNA show out in Toronto. Um, now I'm down in Fort Lauderdale at the uh, Microsoft Leadership Summit, and I'm quite frankly representing you guys. I have a chance today to talk to some of the top executives about uh, what what Microsoft could do better. And some of you participated in my polls. So I appreciate that. That's kind of the housekeeping. Use the chat feature um, to uh, ask your questions. And I'm going to turn it over to uh, to George from WebRoot. We were just discovering that we share the uh, Denver area in common. Uh, and, and WebRoot is based out of uh, just outside Boulder, and we're going to talk about adopting a services-based model for success. So, George, thanks for joining us. How are you doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing great today, um, and thanks for that introduction, Harry. So, um, thanks, everybody, for attending. Um, an increasing amount of my time is being spent with the high growth we've been seeing in our MSP business. So basically, we've sort of grown that business from about 230 MSPs about a year ago to actually today over 1,100. So that's that's in the period of July to, to September, if you like. So that's, that's quite a phenomenal growth. And even before the recession took hold, we were seeing IT suppliers transforming from being product supply to services-led organizations, if you like, and adopting a services-based model. And I even saw that even before I came to, to WebRoot, I was actually working for a large system integrator in Europe. And even there, I could see that transition happening, even at the beginning of the 2000s, even you know, as much as you know, 14 years ago, there was, there was sort of a move away. There was a realization that they were going to have to move away from just being a hardware and software supplier, which, which they were. I mean, I think there was a two billion turnover business so in dollar terms about three and a half billion turnover in hardware and software so you know it's quite a, a quite a big evolution that's going on there as well and so really what's happening is that IT has evolved with IT services now really playing a major role as customers look to focus on core activities and for ways to focus their IT more sharply and yet not increase their IT spend and I think that's been a pretty universal thing in the IT industry you know people want to looking at better ways to do things and to save money if you like so in this webcast, I'm going to try and cover you know, why the market's changed, what you can do to evolve your business to a services-based model that will increase your customer base and also your revenue streams, very importantly, why the traditional VAR model is, is really becoming less and less relevant, and how service providers are positioning themselves as the go-to source for, for all things in IT. I'll also cover very little on WebRoot and why WebRoot is becoming a partner of choice for a lot of MSPs and service providers for endpoint security, uh, you know, basically because we cover things, you know, cover a whole wide range of things there, and also for mobile and, and for the web as well. So let's uh, let's get to the first slide and and go from there. As I mentioned, we've got a lot of VARs that are moving to become MSPs or hybrid resellers, and they're taking a more and more of my time and also of our product development time too. We're doing a, a, we've done a, a ton of work this year on something called Global Site Manager, which is our management console, which is, has been specifically designed for sort of, I'd say, multi-site, multi-customer type deployments and to make it really easy to do that. And the reasons why we're getting so involved in this is, is really straightforward. The market is now, as these figures show, you know, over $100 billion worth of growth is happening between now and 2018. So you could say, why is this rapid service growth? 
And one of the most recent things I could find is a group called the 212 Strategy Group. And in their April 2014 quarterly channel profitability report, they put it this way, technology is getting cheaper and that makes it more difficult to wring profits out of sales. Hardware has long been commoditized and software is following suit. The saving grace, many believe, is services. So I think the really thing to point out here is that managed services is, is really now. It's, 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 it's not just the future, it's, it's actually happening now or you know, service provision is happening. Now. And these figures and industry comments really all sort of attest to that, and also the fact that it's, it's a fairly major market and one that's, that's set to get even more major going forward. A uh, little sort of aside there, we have seen recently, apart from the fact we saw, we saw a lot of sort of middle rank sized companies that adopt managed services or adopt uh, you know, MSP type services. And I think what we've seen now, especially this year, is a lot of large organizations and also smaller organizations. So there seems to be a whole lot of people that sort of got over this this thing of being the cloud and security and all the other concerns are actually saying, well, hey, we just need to do this thing. We're quite happy to put this, this out and have this service in this particular model in this way. But uh, let's look at those drivers and, and maybe in a more sort of like a business level and what's driving companies to use managed services. I think the drivers in IT have always been the same, you know, increase my efficiency, increase my productivity, make me more competitive and reduce costs. I think back to almost where we were you know, a few slides ago. And obviously during the recession as manpower was cut, the only way to maintain services in-house was in many cases for our companies to outsource. Uh, and a lot of things happened, especially in the security area, there was a loss of key staff, and that obviously meant a loss of expertise. And as you know, in IT security expertise is pretty thin on the ground anyway, so, so you know, that's sort of very, very key. So something that's driving it very much in my part of the industry in the security sector, but hey, it's not only the security, it's obviously storage. You know, the virtualization is a whole ton of different things. It's Office 365 or 360, as we were talking about earlier. Uh, and fiscally, I think there's been an interesting drive as well. I think companies have very much moved to looking at things and saying, well, actually, this is not an OPEX expense. This is not sort of an operational expenditure, uh, or it's not, it's not a capital expenditure. It's, it's, an op it's an OPEX expenditure. It's an operational expenditure. So they're looking at certain aspects of the business just to be operational expenditure. So there's been a shift from, from you know, to, should I say, OPEX from CAPEX. Um, so that's uh, so that's that's also sort of a, a help the services model model growth. There's also some key advantages. Um, sorry, I sort of misplaced something here, but it doesn't matter. There's also some key advantages to why uh, the reseller model is really wan uh, is waning. Uh, obviously, it's made it become far more difficult to make adequate margins out of this commoditized hardware and software, which was you know the thing that two 2014 group mentioned. And, and today's market is now all in, all in touch all of the time and always connected. And that's changed customers' demands and their IT operational requirements too. In other words, they sort of, you know, business is very much working on a 24-7 basis this way. I think that's, that's changed things a lot. And, and traditional resellers really have a, have a set of what I call recurring problems. They've got the unpredictability of when customers will upgrade and buy. I mean, I used to remember days when you know, things were pretty much regularly on a three-year cycle. You know, you could sort of pretty much sell an organization a laptop or a, or a desktop or something, and, and three years later they'll come back and actually they've, they've written it down on their capital expenditure, and they'll actually then be prepared and have the budget then to buy again. And that, you know, those sort of replacement cycles really disappeared. Um, you know, customer budgets now just regularly get reprioritized. I mean, something comes along to say, well, the business needs to do this, so we're actually going to take the money from here and, and, and you know, spend it there instead. Um, there's also things that a lot of retailers have high costs. You know, if you be, even if you have been sort of a service provider as such, and you've been supporting customers all the legacy IT, you're in a situation where you're supporting, but you can't charge any more for supporting it. So you're, sort of, you're locked into sort of that sort of high cost cost model of actually supporting things. And that's, that's, I'd say, typically more managed services rather than, uh, than, uh, than what I call a service provider these days. And because things have been slow and people have left, uh, the reseller customer you know, relationship in some ways has, has changed as well. I think there's lots of people. I think that relationship has not been necessarily as strong during the recession as we're coming out of it now. And so it wasn't as strong as it once was. So I think that's something which is, is all sort of like eroding that, uh, eroding that reseller model. There's obviously huge advantages of moving to the MSP model. Um, again, as this 2012 strategy group stated, uh, you know, services are now seen a way out of the situation. I don't think they're seen as a way out. So they are the way out of the situation. You know, a services-based model it really brings with the ability to charge 
far better margins and maintain good profitability on most IT activities. And with Weber, that also of course means being able to offer very cost-effective endpoint security with you know great malware protection and operational costs lower than anyone else's in the business. And also, the MSP model is based on licenses used and lower prices as customers. You know, the customers on demand management mean you know they, they sort of realise that uh, you know you own the license, they don't own the license. So that's 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 a very different model. So it's a lot easier to run, in fact, if you're sort of owning all the licenses and you're managing it all on the customer's behalf rather than actually having to worry about the customer and, and all that sort of part of it. Um, and we've done things like automated, you know, the adding of licenses. We made it very simple for for MSPs to work on the basis of being able to add licenses, take licenses away, and sort of and not really worry about the impact of that, or have to sort of, you know, actually phone up and do that. They can actually do that through the through the console, and we can we can work out exactly how they're using licenses and and charge appropriately. So that's been a very very strong way. So that administrative freedom, you know, is is, is sort of like a big big advantage of the MSP model. So, right at the beginning, I mentioned that there are more and more of my time is spent with with MSPs. In fact, many of them are, are what we would term hybrids. That's that's what I would, I would say is resellers transitioning their business away from hardware and software break fix and support and into being proper you know managed services providers. And in fact, there's been some sort of saying that there's going to be no such thing as a reseller in, in by 2017. I can't I can't quite remember if it was the IDC or ID. Or somebody has sort of come out with that thing, and I think that's probably a bit of rubbish to be honest with you. I think there's always going to be uh, a hybrid sort of model in place in, in many ways because people still will want to buy hardware and software and they won't want everything to be to be managed. But but nonetheless it just it just shows the shift into managed services is 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 so rapid and so huge. Um, and you know the attractions of being an MSP are really quite clear too. You know, there's far lower technology acquisition costs in MSP uh, as I said, we you know, we sell the licenses to the MSP. We do that at a far more uh, advantageous rate than we sell to the open market. Um, and, and so, you know, that's that, that's it's a far better way, for, if, if you like, to buy and to scale up as well, and also get the advantages of scale as well with that. Um, you know, things are annual contracted fees. There's a very predictable return on your mod, on your business model. Where, you know, you're charging a certain fee for things. Um, and I think it also tightens up and, and starts to renew that customer uh, supplier and partner relationship. I think that's that's sort of a key key aspect of it. It's, 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 a, it's a great way of actually you know tightening the relationship between you and uh, and you and the customer because obviously if you're supplying them a service and not just selling them something. You're actually doing something on an ongoing basis for them. That that means there's going to be a lot more contact and a lot more reliance, in fact, from both sides, and a lot more trust and things going on as well. I think MSPs also benefit from things like you know you can standardise the offerings you do. You don't have to you know support everything. You, you know if they're coming to you to offer the service, you can turn around to them and say, well, if we offer you this service, this is the way we provide the service, and this is why we provide it this way. And hey, this is why we're able to charge you this way for it. So I think you know it puts you in sort of a, a far more better position to standardise your offerings and actually have a far more coherent uh, way of actually supplying the services to customers. As I mentioned before, that gives you predictable operating costs, which is very key for you because you know, if you have predictable operating costs, then obviously you've got, you've got predictable costs you can then pass on to the customer. And I, I think the thing to mention is a lot of this, of course, has now become cloud-based, and, and the reason for that is that the operational overheads are much reduced. Uh, you know, as on-site technology is, is, is honestly, you know, you've got to be there. Whereas um, with cloud-based, you can just do everything through a browser, which makes things far, far more efficient. So this physical thing of you know, the hosting is, if you like, been moved away from, from that level. I've sort of made an illustration of that because I thought it would be a lot easier to, to explain it in a diagram than to actually try and explain it to you. And I think it, it just shows you that evolution from a reseller to an MSP. Uh, you know, the solution provider, which, if you like, uh, the standard bar, you know, offers no monitoring or, or customer solutions. You know, it, it's a reactive support. It relies on customers' IT departments, you know, charging for break fits. It expects an on-premise deployment, and you know just provides a basic uh, service in the way of consulting. Whereas the full MSP, you know, one point one over to the right today, that offers full remote management and monitoring of all the customers' infrastructure and scope. You know, using things like RMM, remote management tools. It's providing preventative support management. It's providing prices for recurring provision of services. You know, you're deploying technology in the cloud. You're offering full hosting. And you're really acting as the customer's virtual, you know, chief information officer if it's a security side, but but obviously as you know, almost as their as you know, the IT director if you like in some ways. Of course there are all many sorry, what's happened there? 
because there are many steps in between being a solution provider, but this is an, an, an sort of an MSP, and you can see there's a migration point in between there, MSP sort of version 1 and, and 3 to 1.1. But if you're thinking about it or you're in this sort of scope of things, and you can, you can really sort of see, you know, you can pick yourself where you are at the moment and actually where, where possibly you want to be as, a, as an MSP by using this chart. Well, I was going to say, if, if you don't mind, George, that's no, no. one of the, the better, uh, quite frankly, one of the better presentations of that kind of data that I've seen. So, congratulate. I mean, that's, it's, it's just right. I, even I can understand it. <laughs> good, 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 good. Yeah, no, continue, but I just wanted to give you a shout out that this, this brings home a lot of long-winded conversations into a single slide. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's excellent. I, I'm sure we, I'm sure we've stolen it from somewhere. I'm, I'm sure, I'm not sure if it's originally ours, but um, I, I couldn't claim for that. But um, yeah, I think, I think it's yeah, it's our thinking behind it too. So it just reflected that. So yeah, hopefully, it's, hopefully it helps. Great. So let me get on to uh, trying on the next slide here. So I think there's some things to bear in mind if you're an MSP. You know, what, what should you be seeking out of? The vendors you do uh, you deal with, and also what you should be seeking you know, the technology you deal with. So if, you, if you're you know an MSP already or a hybrid resale MSP, you know what technology should you plan to adopt to service your customers with? So I think it's very key that you look at things like remote management and monitoring tools of some sort. But importantly, you want technology you're using to offer some integration with your RMM. So in other words, if you're going in and adding technology to that then it's very, very key that the, the technology you add actually works with your remote management and monitoring tools. So you, you should be able to integrate with you know, the leading vendors in that area, a lab tech and able to say, uh, uh, we, we do a lot of work with Spiceworks as well. Um, in fact, we've done some, it was, we've got quite a, a deep integration with lab tech and in fact, lab tech, I think, resell our products as well. To say uh, we're, we're sort of way down the track with them and a heavy integration and as the spice works and other platforms we're looking at. But it's very important that you know what we offer and, and or what the technology you buy offers works with our remote management tools. Um, I think um, utility billing is another area which really comes comes out of it. You know, customers using MSPs only want to pay for what they actually want to use. They don't want the license management because they've, they've actually given that license management to you. And of course um, this means that the MSPs get, as I mentioned, very attractive technology rates for buying the license in the first place. But you really then want to be sure that you're being charged by the vendor on a utility basis. So for instance, we do look at, um, for instance, in good examples, maybe the way we work with virtual. Um, we sell virtual uh, licenses, if you like, to people, which is exactly the same as our standard license. But we will actually look at the usage of that virtual license on a virtual machine. Uh, and, ag and aggregate that. So, for instance, let me let me sort of try and illustrate that. Say you've got uh, a machine that's coming up two hours each day, or coming up every two hours, you know, ten times a day. So you've got twenty hours hours usage. Actually, only using one license during that period, we would not charge you for ten different licenses. We would charge you for the one. We'd use it for the utility because we say actually use one license ten times for two hours during that day. So it's actually only one license cost. So that ability to be able to do utility billing is very is very very it's essential for you in the sense because it gives you a very predictable cost coming in, but it's also essential for your recharging models going out the other side. Uh, and since you own the licenses and since you're managing all that side of it, it's very key that you get that. Um, I think another thing that's really sort of essential is the ability to aggregate and, and you know, manage customers, if you like, both globally as well as, as, as individually. Um, so you've got to have a, a system that accommodates administ administration happening at different levels. I mean, I think it's quite key, and I know some people would say, well, my service providers are therefore are taking everything on. Why should there be sort of different administration levels? But, but actually, quite often, that trust thing is built by the fact that you actually do give your customer some form of access to the thing that you're managing for them, and they, they're able to sort of interact with that, and maybe even to, able to run their own reporting or, or have some limited ability to interact with the system that you're running on their behalf. So uh, even though it's a service model, it's, 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 it's also that trust model. In the early days, I think that sort of ability to be able to delegate administration and, and have some sort of access for your customers as well as manage it on their behalf is actually quite, quite, quite key. And also, the, you know, the thing there is the ability to, to drill down and get to various 
customer, customer levels because you want you want to look at things probably alerting at a global level, but you want to actually look at you know individual getting down to you know what that alert was about at the individual level very quickly, and be able to move between those levels and aggregate and manage customers. Very very key things. So something you should really look out for and and bear in mind if you if you've not already gone down this route. So I said I, a little bit for. A little bit of the advert at the end. So, you know, how 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 our solutions are optimised for MSPs, um, and I think the really reason I've been busy with with MSPs is that our endpoint security works for them. Uh, it, you know, it works for PC in a server environment. We use it in virtual environments. In fact, I think I found out the other day that nearly eight percent of all our endpoints out there are, are actually used in virtual environments. Um, we start to use it on tablets and phones as well, obviously the mobile side of it, and even things like point of sale systems. We actually have some MSPs that specialize in retail and are using our product uh, to, to do point of sale systems as well. And I might add that's all with this, the same agent. We well, apart from the mobile agent system, but all the the, the, the Wintel, if you like, type platforms are, are all you all uses the same agent, so you don't have to worry about that side of it. And that means it's also very MSP friendly from that point of view. You don't have to worry about lots of different tech. You're just sort of relying on you know, a few bits of tech to do that. As I said, we've been working very closely with MSPs on Global Site Manager, which is this ability to move between, if you like, the global level and the sort of the individual customer level very, very quickly, and also to give you know, different administration rights to that. So that, that really simplifies the management of, of things that when you're doing multiple customers, if you're using our console, and also integrating the alerts and things and the other things from that console back up to the higher level to, to the RMM tools. So we're sort of trying to tie the, the whole thing together. Hey, you, you might be getting alerting and monitoring coming up at the RMM level, but you're actually going down fixing it at the, uh, at, at the, at the GSM console level. Though we're, we're trying to obviously make as much as possible done from the, the higher level now with, with LabTech and also with, uh, with Kaseya. Um, I think the, the thing I'd mention, uh, which is really sort of driving, I think, our, our market share is, I mean, the MSP market is very much what I call word of mouth driven. We've had very, very positive word of mouth. Um, we have very positive word of mouth in the fact that we do a lot of automatic remediation and things like that, which, which obviously take a lot of cost out of it. Um, and in fact, that, you know, a lot of our case history information coming back, both from MSPs and from our customers, is, you know, dramatic reductions in cost. So, I mean, an example, which actually isn't an MSP one, but it is one I quite like to use, is, is that actually a school environment. And school environments are, you know, are, are really sort of a management headache. You know, all different sorts of devices. You've got old devices. You've got new stuff. It's just it's, it's usually an absolute nightmare. And uh, we just uh, got a case back from Franklin Schools. I think it was about five and a half thousand seats. And they just sort of said, you know, they were spending about 12 hours a week, you know, managing their AV, and now they're down to manage, you know, you know, one hour a week. So you know, it's a huge sort of difference to them, and a, and a sort of huge amount of time saving. So I think that enables then that to, you know it's, it's similar to you know, the MSP situation. If you can reduce that management time down and minimise that, then obviously uh, your costs cost for operating the service go down considerably, and the cost that you can pass on to the customer. Uh, and that combined with the fact that we do what I, I, automatic remediation and rollback, which is a fairly unique thing. In other words, we we will see an infection, we will look at that infection and decide just. Uh, you know, you know, whether there is an infection or not, that might take a, a little period because we work a little bit different from our technology. But we're actually monitoring that all through the time it's doing that, and then if we find it's actually it's actually malicious, then we actually quarantine it, stop it, and then we actually roll the machine back to its last good known state. So that saves a huge amount of cost in re-imaging machines, which lots of you know basically traditional AV. If you get infected and it goes through, then and basically going to have to re-image that machine and take it out of action. So again, a huge cost and, and, and a real way of denting the cost. So MSPs really find a lot of operational advantages with uh, with using web routes. Uh, and I think I'll probably cover the next slide by sort of explaining that. Um, I said, you know, just don't take our word for it. Um, I think this is a, a nice slide. You know, working with web route sales team, it's very clear that web route gets us. They get it. They get the industry. They get MSP. To get the customers, um, this is not uh, an atypical comment. We, if you go on YouTube and look at uh, a lot of testimonials from MSPs, you'll find we've got we've got tons of this. It's not just not just the, not just the one. So that's really it. Um, I hope um, I hope that's been useful and uh, really open it to questions, Harry. Yep. Uh, thanks, Harry. Uh, let's see. Um, Going back to the, uh, let's. Let, I, I I have a question. Let's let's go back to that slide that I adored so much, and then I have okay. one. Okay. 
And folks, be sure to use the chat feature for your questions. Hang in there. Some lucky winner is going to win the chawbone. <laughs> okay, so on this, um, what I'm trying to see, yeah, I don't think I saw it. I don't think I have to see it. I was kind of looking for maybe where the voice or unified communications side fit in. This slide isn't necessarily um, discussing product stacks, so it's not really no, it's not. Or no. voice or what have you. <laughs> it's, no, it's really, yeah. this, is really discuss, this is really discussing approach, isn't it? Just, just the approach to the, those different things. So, you know, if you're, if, if you're just you know doing hardware and software selling, and obviously if you're monitoring, you're doing none. You're, you know, the only the only thing you're selling is you're probably reselling support that you're the vendor support for that, but you're doing no monitoring of the actual situation. And then you know what tended to happen is as people got into more to a managed services model, they started to do remote management and, and monitoring or something. So so you know someone came along to them and said, well actually you know I've got these storage servers, you know, and I've got these other servers. I need to make sure they're up all the time. Can you can, you know we've lost some staff. Can you do you know help us with the remote management and monitoring? Um, and that was sort of that, that level of things. And then what happened was that the, the, the service provider came back and said, well, actually, you know, you maybe shouldn't be managing these things at all. We can just manage the whole thing for you. We can host the whole thing for you, and we can take it into the cloud, and, and we can do it various other ways. I mean, the cloud's just a way of saying, you know, you know, hosting it for somebody else, really, on some basis. So you can see these are just progressive things between, you know, you yeah. know the different areas of how they were working and, 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 how, and how it's progressed. And, and probably there's going to be MSP you know, 1.2 or MSP 2.0 or whatever, and you know, that'll be sort of, uh, you know, it'll be an advancement of that, and that will be, uh, that will probably be in the next few years as well. I mean, I think we'll see some, we'll see a lot more developments in the managed services space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the one thing you can count on, the, the, the one constant is change. And yeah. um, I have another question, but we've had a couple from the uh, attendees roll in. So hold off on my question for a minute. Okay. Um, I'll circle back at it. So uh, gentleman, uh, Chris uh, Porowski is asking, is there GFI Max integration? Uh, I'm afraid not is the answer to that. Um, I, funny enough, I have been asked for that before, and I think it's something we're going to have to start looking at because um, it would obviously make sense to uh, to do that. I think they, they if my understanding is GFI, but not, did they buy another solution from I got a funny feeling they bought another solution to somebody else, um, which was a competitive AV. I, I'm can yeah. swear to that. That's maybe probably why we didn't support it originally. But I think we, we're going to have to look at G, GFI. Are actually a, a, a technology partner of ours. We actually OEM some technology to GFI, so so we do okay. know the GFI guys fairly well. So the answer is no, not at the moment. But uh, okay. and we haven't tested it. It might actually some of the integration stuff might already work, but it just it's it, we have, we haven't tested that. Yeah, yeah, and then uh, Chris has a follow-up question. What does holistically outsourced mean? It means basically you've outsourced pretty much everything. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> you're you know? out, so, so basically, if you're holistically outsourcing, you're you're basically putting out the complete running, the complete, you know, the the whole lot, if you like, as is outsourced. You're not. You're, you're sort of outsourcing the vast majority. So the staffing, if you like, is there's no staffing hardly at all left at the at the end of the as far as the organisation is concerned. They just put everything out. They're letting the whole IT be run by a service provider. So you can see that in the situation. You've got a small business or a smallish business, and what they want is they want managed office. They need some servers. They need their you know, they need some stuff for their sorts to do their accounts and expenses, etc. And but but basically, what they've decided to do is run none of that in house. They just want to, to to just put the whole lot of put the whole business IT, if you like, structure out, uh, and that's what holistically outsourced is. And I think there's a lot of even quite large companies now are are sort of doing that. They're they're actually outsourcing what have been considered key parts of their business. You know, a few years ago. I mean, there are exceptions. I mean, the industries. They probably ex uh, accept to that are you know financial services, pharmaceuticals, um, to a certain extent, all the ones that have got a lot of IP that they're worried about, or, or have a lot yeah. of you know or a lot of risk, are less likely to do holistic outsourcing. But a lot of other organisations have basically said, well, actually, this is the way we want to run it. And as that that move from they are looking at it as an operational expense and not a capital expense. I mean, that's that's that 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 whole shift carried to its logical conclusion. Um, so that's. That's why the market is growing so rapidly. It's because so many companies are now deciding to put so much 
out of the. It's not just a few services they're putting. They're starting to put a lot out there, and that's 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 the interesting thing we're seeing, and that's 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 the that's the trend, and that's why people are realizing that, and that's why people are saying that the hardware and software market is not going to exist as such because there's so much holistic outsourcing going ahead, and it also yeah. enables people. The other thing about that is, and what people forget is, it, if you if you're doing and using that model. It actually gives you competitively an agility as well. So you can be having a service, and you can be using somebody to provide a service for you. If you see a better service or something else somewhere elsewhere, you then switch over. So a lot of people are using it as well as a, as a way of sort of, if you like, keeping up with change and keeping up with technology. And they realize if they work in a services-based model, they're not buying the kit, they're not having to invest in all that. that they're not having to invest in the training and everything. They can just. So they can, you know, their, their cost of change, if you like, has all of a sudden gone down a lot, and their speed of change has gone up. So, um, so that's 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 for reflecting what's happening there. Oh, okay. Uh, on the slide, got a couple questions from the slide up. So, uh, okay. Let's see. Hang on a second. What's the, in your own words, uh, gentleman's asking, what's the difference between proactive and preventative uh, on that slide? So we're talking column two and three, second line. And to some extent, you hit on it, but but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, proactive management is means, but you basically you sort of you know you're proactively getting in there and uh, and and doing things when things you know when things go wrong. Whereas I think preventative is 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 far more about the fact that you're not waiting for things to go wrong at all. You're actually you're actually saying actually this storage you know the meantime between failure and the storage or the, or I'm I'm seeing some. I'm seeing some sort of chase of the fact that the performance of this disk is not so good, so I'll actually immediately repl I'll replace that now. I won't wait for it to go wrong. So you're actually sort of you're far more attuned to sort of preventative side of things, actually making keeping things up and keeping that sort of you know, I suppose your your multi multi level you know n plus one architecture if you like uh, zooming along rather than waiting for a, a, a you know waiting for some sort of failure and then reacting on it. So proactive is. It's just really taking proactive to its logical thing. It's just taking it on to the next step to, to, to be more preventive about it, actually doing things even before, even anticipating things before they happen and actually doing something about it so before it becomes an issue. Uh, let's see. Let me move off. I'll come back to another question on the slide in a minute, but we'll get into, looks like, some uh, other, other questions. Um, is it a requirement to proxy all traffic through the web root server? Uh, in the sense that, because of the way we work, it is it is you have to send the individual information from the agents has to be able to go up to the web root server. Yes. Okay. Okay. Because uh, we're a cloud-based solution, so the, the, the way our endpoint product works is it, it arrives. It's a very small agent arrives on the machine. It sort of will very quickly go through the machine, looking at all the files and processes on there, it will immediately start to categorize those into known good and known bad. It might end up with some what we call unknowns or undetermined. Um, obviously, the known bad are stopped. Obviously, the known good are allowed to run. Um, the things that are undetermined, we will we will keep, we'll send a little bit more information, usually hashed encrypted values of the, of the, uh, of the actual files and processes to the cloud, we then use the cloud, the processing power in the cloud, to decide whether it's bad or not. And we look at the evolving behavior. We also let those unknown things run in a sort of like a, I suppose it, people would say a sandbox, but it isn't a sandbox. It's really what I call restricted rights, and I, they, they're only allowed to do certain things. And we switched on our journaling and monitoring at that stage as well. So, so that the whole effect of that is eventually it might take us. Sometimes it takes us. Um, a few hours to decide that something's malicious, to be honest with you. It takes, because a lot of malicious programs will actually arrive in machines now and behave in a very benign way for quite a long period of time, or, or they have some other trigger. And in fact, as long as it's not triggering anything or doing anything that we would determine malicious to that machine, then we, you know, we, we, we're, we're letting it run, but we're journaling it the whole time. So as soon as it starts to do something, as soon as we get to that determination point, we then sort of immediately say, right, that's it, it's malicious. We've, we, you know, we're, 99.99. I'm so sure it's malicious. We're going to stop that, and then at the same time, we take the machine and we actually literally reset. And if it's changed anything in that machine, we change those settings back to where they were before. So a lot of people found that very useful. And, and you know, when Crypto Locker first came out, um, and it was doing all that encryption work, we were probably the only anti-malware out there that was actually allowing remediation of Crypto Locker, uh, you know, out of the box without you know, actually doing anything about it. Um, 
we then got into a sort of a, what I would call a, a battle, I suppose, with the cyber criminals because they realised we were one of the few that could do that, and they've done lots of things now to try and obfuscate and and to sort of hide, if you like, what they're doing from us, and and so we found ourselves in a bit of a, an arms race, if you like, as far as crypto lockers concerned, and uh, yeah. Ah. yeah, so and that's just the way it is because even if you can defend against something, then obviously they're gonna they're gonna try and uh, they're gonna try and stop you, but. Um, Sure. So that's that's interesting, and that's something that's going. That's actually an ongoing battle as we speak. So, but it's just because of the way of our technology works. But, but the whole the whole benefit to to both the customer and to the MSP is that you know the the, the machine is eventually is obviously remediated automatically. They don't have to do anything about it, and also that um, it's not taking out of circulation. There's not been a cost for re-imaging it. So there's a whole lot of if you like both operational and and cost benefits in in our, in our approach to doing it. But it's it's also a reason why, and something evolved into a slightly different topic, is that when we get tested sometimes, we don't test particularly well, because if people throw a whole ton of malware at the machine, which is what the test environment tends to do, yes, a lot of it will pick up instantly and, and right away. We reckon about 98% is normally our sort of original sort of rate on that. But because we move into this different level then of, of protection and, and, and looking where we turn, turn on our journaling and and uh, decision making, if you like, part of it. We look at the grey as well, uh, which you know, an AV just simply says this is good, or you know, or the, actually, an AV just simply says this is bad. We actually say this is known good, so it's, it's perfectly safe. So it's like a white list of it. This is known bad. This is you know a black list of it, and then we have this grey list, if you like, with this grey area. It's a very different thing, which um, so it makes it very difficult to test our technology because it might take us time. To actually sort of clean something off a machine because it either hasn't acted maliciously to start with, or in fact we're still making a decision about whether to take it or you know to stop it or not. Yeah. Anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a uh, uh, gentleman Chuck Berg is asking, how about integration to Autotask? Yeah, not not yet is the answer to that. We we are we are actively looking at integration to a whole lot of RMMs and and. You know, like any vendor, we started off with, uh, I suppose, with the larger, with the larger, more commonly used platforms. I mean, I get a ton of requests for Enable, and I'm, I'm, I'd love to be able to do Enable and as well. And that's something, again, we're trying to look at. But Enable got sort of certain limitations that made it difficult. So the answer is yes, we're looking at, at all of these things, but not, we've not done what to task yet. Okay. Okay. Great, folks. Be sure to use the chat feature to ask your questions. Um, the one, one of the questions. I told you I'd circle back to with this slide up was the difference between MSP 1.0 and 1.1. Person wanted clarification, and to be honest, I think I think you've kind of done that. We we've had several questions um, off of this slide. Um, one one thing that kind of stands out to me, and it goes back to a prior slide on sort of the uh, the growth in the MSP market and the change nature of the reseller market is maybe it's going to be MSP 2.0, but I do really believe there's a role out there, I don't know where I would put it on the slide under 2.0 or whatever, but there's going to be a role out there for uh, with, with cloud for the sort of sales agent reseller who never really touches the technology and doesn't manage the technology, yeah. makes their commission and moves on. Um, are you, you know, are, are, are you familiar with that? You, you've heard of or seen sales agents over on the telecom side? We we would we would we would call that an aggregator, and we find we we work with people today who are who are really who are really aggregators as such. Um, so yeah, so that that okay. is that is that 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 is happening, and uh, you know that's def that's definitely part of part of part of the market. Um, and I think it's especially when you get this, you know, when people are looking for better solutions, they you know they, they tend to go out and look for a consultant, somebody who can give them some advice, and say, well, I've already got this, but what should, you know. You, you look at my business by moving to something else. Is there a better way for me to do this? So that you know, that's that's where that comes in. Okay, we have a question from uh, Michael Chris. Michael asks, can the definition file updates be stored on a shared drive on a network that has many installations to keep internet traffic down? Ah, okay. So, okay, again, we do not work like a traditional AV. So. There is actually no updating at all involved with the web root product. So all the updating we do happens in the cloud, in our cloud data centers of the web root intelligence network. 
the only thing that's passing between that endpoint uh, device, whether that's a mobile or you know, server or whatever it happens to be, and us, is if there's a new or highly changed file or process starts to run on that machine. And then at that stage, we get interested. We switch. We say we're trying to determine what it is. We'll immediately sort of do the, the same process. But there's a little, there's a little local cache, obviously, on each. We we sort of protect each machine individually. It's a very hard thing to explain. You know, a, a general AV, what they do is they they give you they give you sort of one great big database to give you a whole lot of you know functionality within it, if you like the, the program itself, and that's it. And it's the same for everybody. Whereas for us, we go into that individual machine. We look at the individual files and processes running in that individual machine. We build an individual cache for that machine of the stuff that's known good for that machine. And as soon as anything changes from that, then that's when we get interested. So the only traffic that's flowing back and forward typically is typically 100, 150 kilobytes maybe a day. So compared to just even doing a you know a standard sort of download of um, a definition file, which probably you know megs, five or six megs, if you like, I think so for one definition file update these days, we've talked about 150k a day amount of traffic because because there's very little. People are not constantly loading new applications or new things onto the onto the, the, the devices. Hey, they might be browsing the web, they might be getting infections coming in, and that's different. But uh, you know, it's we look at those as well, and obviously what we're doing is that it's just that small amount of traffic we deal with. So we don't have this thing of definition updates. Again, it's a huge cost saving. It also means people who are working in highly compliant environments, they don't have to worry about the technology being up to date because they're continually up to date. Every endpoint is continuing up to date. And also if we protect one individual, so if you imagine one we see the thing for one individual because we we, we you know, immediately categorize that and put that into our intelligence network in the cloud, we then collectively have protected everybody at the same time as well. So anybody else who sees that, we just immediately determine that as being bad and you know, there's no sort of, there's no sort of um, or good or whatever the classification you know, happens to be. So you know, we are immediately able to sort of collectively protect people. So it's a very different model. Well, I'll tell you what, I think I think we may be at that time. The deck is clear, so I've spun the cool. wheel. Um, I've come up with uh, Daryl Brow of Prometheus. So, Daryl, you have won the Jambox. Uh, it's the Jambox Diamond. It's $180. So congratulations. Heather from the office will be uh, in touch with you in terms of getting the prize to you. And, George, appreciate you stopping by on our, our oh, webinar and educating our community. <laughs> Great. <laughs> okay, guys, thank you. All right, look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you. Okay, everybody back to work. We'll see you. Bye-bye.